Hi there, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Trish Gray, and I'm the Senior Development Manager for the O'Reilly School of Technology. And the webcast today is with Steve Holden. Steve is the Chairman of the Python Software Foundation. He's the author of a book called Python Web Programming. And we're excited to announce that he is the author of our Python Programming Certificate Series being off, off, offered through the O'Reilly School of Technology and the University of Illinois Office of Continuing Education. Now, uh, Python 1 has already been released, so you can already take that now, but the remaining three courses will be released uh, within this year. Um, so, Steve, you know, without further Hi. ado, I'll turn yeah. it over to you, and I'd like to know how long have you been involved in Python, and how did that come about? Well, I've been involved with object-oriented systems for quite a long time. I read uh, the early papers by Alan Kay's group at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center mm -hmm. in 1973. Oh my gosh. And uh, became a fan of object-oriented systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and even during my time as, a, as a, a researcher at Manchester University, supervised the implementation of Smalltalk. But I never really thought that Smalltalk was a language that, that I was comfortable with mm -hmm. expressing uh, object-oriented systems. Mm -hmm. It seemed a little clunky somehow. Yeah, so I dabbled a little in small talk myself, oh, okay, so I right. what so you're talking you understand. about. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, great language uh, yeah. and a terrific introduction to object-oriented concepts, but sure. I wanted something that was a bit more natural to me as, a, as an experienced programmer. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I went for dinner one day and they handed me uh, a, a pager, and so I went upstairs into the local bookstore to, to while away some time. Right. I came across uh, Learning Python, the O'Reilly book by uh, Lutz and Asher. Wow. And uh, I read it and I thought, well, this is a language I really want to use. So I became mm -hmm. excited about Python, got involved involved with it and uh, very quickly uh, started using it as, as almost my only programming language. Wow, and so you've been using it for a good 15 years now. That's right, yeah, yeah. that's right. And now how did you come about to become the chairman of the Python Software Foundation? Can you tell me a little bit about that? I was, well, yeah, I was kind of hooked into that one by, uh, by Guido Van Rossum, the inventor of the language. He encouraged me to uh, start and chair the PyCon conference, which is a community-based conference yes. for Python users. So very the close knit community. That, well, it's it's yeah, it's, it's actually quite an open. I mean, we want we want as many people as we can in there, and we're actually taking active steps to increase the diversity of the the Python community. But um, the nice thing about PyCon is it's a relatively low-cost conference. Right. It, it's not a huge thing, and so we're, we're trying to encourage you know, people who've got technical things to contribute who don't necessarily have the same funding levels that the big corporations do. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do get a very good turnout at our, our PyCon. So anyway, Guido encouraged me to start PyCon. Uh, and after the first conference, he nominated me for membership of the, the Software Foundation. Uh -huh. And I think a year later I joined the board, and two years after I joined the board, the then chairman, Stefan Diebel, resigned, and uh, they elected me chairman. The board elects the chairman of the, the Software Foundation. Okay, well, fantastic. Congratulations for that. Thank and you. I haven't been to PyCon myself, but I hear it's very exciting and, and close-knit and fun community. And oh, so, sure, yes. You know, as a LAMP programming myself, if I learn some Python, then perhaps I can help with your diversity issue. Indeed, uh. yeah, sure, <laughs> sure, yeah, although we did increase the, the proportion of women uh, at PyCon this year went up to about 11%, so we're making oh, inroads on it, yeah, oh, we're making always, inroads. That's great to hear. But of course, we're not just looking for gender diversity, there's all <laughs> other kinds you have to consider as well. Oh, we have a guest that says, I love PyCon diversity, so that's, oh, cool. that's good to hear. Um, okay, so tell me why you love Python so much. Uh, because it's such a great language. It, the really neat thing about Python is it makes uh, difficult things easy mm -hmm. and impossible things possible almost. So it's just a very natural way uh, to, to express algorithms. And I think the main reason for that is that Guido Van Rossum, the, the guy who, who came up with this language, had the primary insight that programs are actually read by human beings. Yes. Uh, as a means of communication, mm -hmm. much more than they're, they're used by computers. So right. it's important not just to have a language that the computer can understand, mm -hmm. but a language that humans can understand as well. And it's very interesting. I've, I've presented Python to uh, colleagues of mine from the training world who only know the, the Microsoft 
world. So maybe they looked at C sharp mm -hmm. or Visual Basic or something like that. And you show them some simple Python and their eyebrows go up and they say, oh, wow, I can actually read that and kind <laughs> of understand what it does. So it's right. a very readable language. Okay. And that makes it a, a, a fairly easy language to learn. Now, would you say it's a, it's a fairly pure object-oriented language? I, I uh, originally started in C++, so mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty pure in terms of object orientation. That's pretty pure, yeah. The yeah. nice thing about, about Python is it doesn't force you to use object-oriented programming if you don't want to. Okay. So it has the ability to define functions which are completely independent of the classes mm -hmm. you may have oh, in your object-oriented model. Handy. So you can do procedural programming sure. just as easily as you can do object-oriented right. programming. It's designed to be easy for, for both. And how does that tie into web programming? I know that I... I uh, probably an ill-informed thing to do, but I started out with <laughs> web programming trying to mash C++ into the web, and that's okay. very tough to do. So how, I would how, imagine, yeah. You know, I hear that Python is great for web programming, Google uses it. Yeah, a lot of people use, use Python for web programming, and, mm -hmm. and indeed there are a number of, of frameworks. There's Turbo Gears, Pylons, Can't Django, yes. yeah, Zoop, um, Grok, which is built on top of Zoop, Plone. I mean, there are all kinds of different web systems available, so there's there's something for all tastes. Okay. But it's it's not just for web language, uh, for for web applications. Mm -hmm. They're using it in uh, you know people are using it for numerical computations. Uh, the Space Science Telescope Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using it for biological computations, informatic, bioinformatics is a, a huge applications area for Python nowadays. Oh, yeah, so it, it's being deployed not only in the commercial world but in the, the scientific world as well. Okay, well that's starting to make my head spin because I don't know anything about Python. So, um, <laughs> so let, let me ask you how you got involved with the O'Reilly School of Technology. Well, uh, I went to OSCON, as I do from time to time. I can't get there every year, but uh -huh. uh, the last time I was OSCON, uh, I met Scott Gray, who's the, uh, in charge of the, uh, the O'Reilly School of Technology. He mm -hmm. was introduced to me uh, by my buddy Ben Bangert, who said, I know you do training, uh, mm -hmm. and Scott's looking for somebody to put some Python courses together. Fantastic. So it seemed like an unmissable opportunity. So we, we got our heads together at PyCon, which at OSCON, which I think was in September, and we didn't start working on, on outlining the classes until the following January. So it's taken a while, but we've got one class now up and running and another one uh, about to hit the yeah. about to hit the stands so yeah just a little side note for everybody out there uh, building an OST course uh, is initially very difficult because we have a sandbox system and in the sandbox system the technology the real technology is brought to you through a web browser and we try to make that as streamlined as possible so that you can focus on the learning and the communication with your instructor so um, I, I'm hoping that maybe you can tell me about this first course, which is called Python 1, Beginning Python, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how you went about building this. Okay, well that's basically a, a good question. What I had to do is I had to ask myself, what do people need to know mm -hmm. in order to be able to make effective use of Python? And uh, Scott is, he's a bit of a slave driver because he, <laughs> he always looks at things from the, the student point of view, which is great as an author because mm -hmm. writing a, an O'Reilly School of Technology class is very different from writing a traditional class mm -hmm. where you know your lead, as a traditional instructor-led class, you're going to be in class helping the students. Uh, right. Whereas when they're learning online, it's not quite the same thing because they're, they have to try to make their own way and understand as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that instructors are available for the students to, to interact with if they need to. You right. can send questions in, uh -huh. that kind of thing. More on a coaching basis than That's on right. an I'm standing in front of the room kind exactly. of basis. Exactly. So you, you need to have the materials structured in such a way that people have pretty much all they need in front of them mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to learn the class. Yeah, and, and our methodology is a little different in that we uh, house the, the course materials within the technology itself, so then you also have to speak to the technology. Well, that's right. If people are looking at the, uh, the webcast screen, then what, uh -huh. they'll, what they'll see my computer projecting is the the learning environment in fact this is this is what it looks like when you take a, an OST class so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to these are the the different lessons there and you can see that at the moment I've 
I've just finished lesson one, uh, and mm -hmm. I've, I've had my project graded. So if I click on the graded link now, uh, and this is actually feedback from the person who's taken a look at the code I yes. wrote. This is a real person To satisfy here. the end. Yes. Yep, that's right. So uh, that's just some notes about the material I handed in. Uh, a welcome from Kerry, who's uh, very encouragingly saying that I can email her if ever I want. And apparently, I've passed that objective. So my, my code must have been okay, which Good is job. nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, you know, in the, in the first instance, there's not actually a, a huge amount uh, going on there. The getting started chapter, the very first one, just basically gets people familiar with the environment, has them run uh, an interactive interpreter session, that kind of stuff. Just put a few a few lines of code in there. Then we move on to uh, entering and, and storing data. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, we start to look at things like, well, how do you make decisions, um, iteration for and while loops, and so on and so forth. And of course, each of the, the lesson links uh, brings the, the material for that lesson up. And so the way that you learn is by going through, and then you either have code which you, you type in as program files uh, and run, mm -hmm. or we, we also do interactive sessions where we have people um, take, uh, I don't know whether there's an interactive session in this chapter, let's see if we can find one. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, there we are, so there's an interactive session. So their uh, code that you need to enter is in blue and uh, everything that the computer spits out uh, is in black. So sometimes we're encouraging people to do what I encourage them to do a lot in, in live classes. Yes which is answer their own questions by directly playing with the interpreter. You answer right. your questions by, I call it, asking the interpreter. Type a statement in yes. uh, and see what it does. Yes, and we, we fully believe in learning in your own voice, meaning you know, um, maybe the, the course material tells you to try something and tries to explain it, but we want you to be able to experiment and think, well, I wonder what would happen if I did this. Exactly, yeah, and I encourage students to, to do that kind of thing in the learning environment because sometimes when you're at work, mm -hmm. you don't really feel terribly confident right. you know, poking around in things that you shouldn't really maybe be touching or you'd be you're scared of breaking something. But, I mean, A, I doubt very much whether anything's really going to break yeah. in the O'Reilly environment. Right. They seem to have put a pretty good teaching system together. Absolutely. And B, uh, if it does break, then you know, nothing urgent has happened at no work. Big deal. Uh, it's the best place to try and break things, in fact, yes. I so I encourage students to experiment a lot. When the more the when better. Scott used this training method on, on some uh, elementary school teachers, he said that if you break it, then we will give you a candy bar. Okay. That's how it, you can't be afraid to break it. Um, did he take a box of candy bars with him or did he not He only any? had to give one candy bar out the entire time and people tried their, they wanted those candy bars. Oh sure, <laughs> yeah. You can motivate geeks that way and teachers are no different I don't think really. Exactly. And not, not only is that a, kind of a scary aspect for someone who's a complete beginner, you know, yeah. we, we don't assume any sort of experience in programming with Python 1, is that correct? Uh, you don't need any programming experience at all. If you have some, the course will probably go a little more It'll quickly. Go a little faster. But yeah, I've mm -hmm. tried to take the approach. Because the thing is, there's, there's a lot of people who are going to need to use Python for vocational purposes. Python's Correct. being embedded into all kinds of environments right. now. So there are tools like um, Mojave and Blender, which right. are three-dimensional design tools. Right. Uh, and they've got Python put in there as the scripting language. Right. Uh, SPSS, the statistics package for the social sciences, mm -hmm. which is used in, in scientific environments and academic institutions right. all over the world, they are now using Python right. to allow people to build graphical user interfaces Correct. to the SPSS environment. Okay. So people are, are going to come in whose primary task mm -hmm. isn't programming at all. They have a job to do and they need to do some programming exactly. in order to do the job. So we're trying to, to build a class that, that will let them start from scratch right. basically. And therein lies the problem with, with most training is that you know, if the training says, here's the material, you need to go in and get this framework and download this program. And, it, you know, even as an experienced programmer myself, I would love to learn Python, but I don't mm -hmm. have time. And it's a little intimidating to say, oh, uh, go, go find pylons and, and download that and, and get it all set up. And, sure. and then we'll start the class. And you know, yep. here we have something all ready to go for you. And you should have, I'm, I'm assuming, have uh, students programming something within five minutes of starting. 
Exactly, yes. Right? And in fact, um, as, as, as we got into the second course, it became very apparent that Scott's approach was you try and make sure mm -hmm. that within the first five minutes of, the, of each lesson, the student is, is typing some code in. And right. you must not copy and paste the code, by the way. You have to type it in because that's actually an essential <laughs> part of the, the learning experience. Yeah. And, and Scott yeah. talks about learning Python by making Python programs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a really good thing. The, the fact is that most people are really much more motivated by, even if they don't necessarily understand the code they're typing in, if they can get to run it and see what it does, right. that's a big motivator because they've actually made significant progress. That's, that's good to know. I've got a couple of questions on oh, there. Okay. I'm look here. Yep. Um, you know, somebody wants to know what the difference is between PHP and Python. Um, I'm actually curious about that myself because I'm a PHP programmer. Yeah, okay. Well, PHP, uh, until version 6 anyway, which came out recently, PHP was a difficult language to build large systems in mm -hmm. because any variable names that you, des you defined, they all lived in the same namespace. So that made it difficult to build large systems because the code that you, you wanted to use as components mm -hmm. didn't have a boundary around it. Okay. So if you imported a piece of somebody else's code who used, let's say, the variable x, mm -hmm. and you were using x as a variable in, in your PHP code, then mm -hmm. there would be a conflict between them. So right. that means that in order to build, and people have successfully built large systems in PHP, mm -hmm. but in order to be able to do that, they've had to be very disciplined about the naming conventions that they've used to avoid these naming conflicts. Mm -hmm. Now, in Python, each individual module has its own namespace. Right. So there's no danger that my function can, or, or my code can use a variable, uh -huh. which will then somehow leak out and pollute somebody else's piece of code. It's so more it's, encapsulated. Exactly, so it's much easier to, to build programs from collections of components Gotcha. than it is in PHP. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question, whoever asked that? Um, now, uh, I had another question up here, if Go I can ahead. find it again. Yeah. Um, it has to do with um, you know, whether the courses cover certain uh, technologies as QT or GTK. Ah, I'm that's not that's with, interesting. No, QT like and that. GTK, um, well, GTK is a graphics technology and QT is a, a windowing technology built on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, we had to take a view as to which of, of many possible graphical user interfaces we taught. Right. Uh, and I was a bit pragmatic about that. Uh, I thought, what's the, the easiest thing for people to do is right. to use something that's already built into Python. So okay. the three most common frameworks, windowing frameworks for Python are, are Tikinta, which comes installed Tikinta. with Python. All right. um, the PyQt library, which the questioner mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, and WX Python. Now, I'm actually a WX Python user for most of my own GUI work, sure. but because I want people to be able to start building graphical user interfaces as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. I've actually developed, there are three lessons in, in Python 2 about building graphical user interfaces, and they okay. use the Tikinta library. They use Tikinta. Yeah, but again, I've tried to, to develop that material in such a way that we're focusing mostly on the principles of developing graphical user right. interfaces. So although there are differences between the frameworks, I hope that users who aren't necessarily going to end up using Tikinta mm -hmm. Can still will apply. nevertheless learn enough about building GUIs that they'll be able to take that experience forward. Right. Now, we're still talking about additional material that we can make as ancillary. Uh -huh. uh, so what would be great would be, for example, if, if someone out in the the lazy web world, someone out on the internet uh, wanted to you know, take a look at the the materials we've done on Tikinta mm -hmm. and then do parallel materials for the, the, the other platforms, right. I'd be happy to get those somehow linked in so LinkedIn, that people yeah. could leverage the other platforms as well. Well, that's a good segue because I really am really curious about seeing uh, what's going to be in the remaining three courses. Um, as I said before, the, the, the Python programming certificate series, uh, which uh, Steve is authoring, 
is uh, a four core series and only the first one has been released. The, the rest of them will be released the rest of the year. And each of these courses, because we have a partnership with the University of Illinois, each course is con considered a non-credit professional development course through the University of Illinois Office of Continuing Education. So each course has about four continuing education units attached to them. And when you complete the entire course, you receive a certificate from the University of Illinois. Um, so this series is supposed to go from I don't have any programming experience at all mm -hmm. to what? Hey, I'm a Python programmer, I'm I guess, is, is where we're trying. Yeah, I'd like people to, to think of themselves at the end of the class as, as competent, not necessarily practiced Python programmers, because the thing that really makes you a programmer is, is actually putting those skills to mm -hmm. use in the workplace at the what we might call the code face. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if we take a look at the, the materials in the first one, first of all, just this is the one that, that has been published. Sure. We're looking at the very basic stuff to start with. Yeah, so we, we look at decision-making with the if statement, the for and while loops, all the standard flow of control stuff that people need uh, in programming. Mm -hmm. And then we go on to uh, looking at sequences, uh, sets and dicts, then string formatting, uh, mm -hmm. more stuff about looping, we teach them how to interact with the file store, then we start to do the more complicated stuff like define functions so that if you've got code that you want to use again and again and sure. again you can simply call the function to do it instead of mm -hmm. doing the, the copy and paste stuff that people so, right. so often seem to feel is necessary as, as beginners. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we, we talk about the built-in functions and how to define your own functions. We take a first look at the standard library which existing Python users will know is this huge collection of, of functionality that you can, with the Python standard library, you can solve almost any problem. I mean, there are... Really? Well, there are external libraries for things that you can't necessarily do, but mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of stuff in the standard in. library that allows you to do things like writing network mm -hmm. programs, uh, doing math you know, computing mathematical functions, uh, there's graphical user interface code in there. You know, it, right. it's difficult to think of an application area that's not assisted by something that's in the, the Python library. So we have exactly. to take a, a first look at the standard library. Right, you don't want to reinvent the wheel if you don't. Absolutely have not, no. If, if there's something already there, the Python approach is use it. Uh -huh. don't, don't need to do anything else. So we go back to functions and then finally, towards the end of the class, we start to look at uh, object-oriented programming, how people can define their own classes mm -hmm. in their own programs, because that's useful not just because it's, it's generic programming knowledge, but because it makes sense of a lot of the standard library as well. Right. A lot of, for example, if I want to send an email, mm -hmm. I import the SMTP lib module, mm -hmm. and I create an SMTP object from that library, okay. and then I tell that object to do things by calling its methods. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting because I even experience programmers, when you learn a new language, the, it seems like the concepts are all the same. Okay, I get it. I need to learn loops. I need to learn functions. I need to learn uh, object-oriented classes in the class structure. But yep. how you go about it can be so much different. Well, it's, it's not always easy, yes, and another great thing about working with Scott is mm -hmm. he's always telling me, I will, maybe if there's a piece of programming to do, because <laughs> I've been programming 14 billion years, uh, I tend to just write the code down, right. and Scott says, wait a minute, that code mm -hmm. did not just form itself ready-made in your mind, Exactly. even though it happened quickly, there was a thought process behind it. Mm -hmm. What was that thought process? So we're trying to explain, for the benefit of the students who are coming in without any or much programming experience, yeah. how to actually invent your own programs as well, how yeah. to make your, your own programs. So in fact, the, the last chapter of the last lesson of the first class uh -huh. is on how you actually put everything together and, and build and debug whole yeah. programs. Now, I, I, I kind of experienced the same thing because I wrote the PHP SQL series. Oh, okay. And um, it's extremely hard to put yourself back to the part where you, where you were a complete beginner. It is, and, yeah, uh, it and, is. And kind of uh, anticipate the questions that are going to be in their minds. Scott's you know, the, the very more good advanced parts are easier he, to... He helps me a lot with that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of teaching experience, mm -hmm. but there are differences between, between teaching in class and, and teaching through uh, a distance medium like a Riley School of Technology does. Right. And there are, there are differences in writing books as well, and Scott's kind of keeping me on the, the straight and narrow and making sure that that the material is actually tailored for, the, for its purpose. Now I have a question here, it says, how do these courses benefit experienced programmers? Do we have to start with the basics of Python class? Uh, just so you know, you don't 
have to start with anything that you don't want to. Um, it, unless you're pursuing the entire certificate, which university rules require uh, that you take yeah. and complete all four courses. Um, if you're just looking to learn Python, have some courses under your belt, and have some experience under your belt through the projects and quizzes, you, you can, if you feel like you have the prerequisites, um, then you can skip around uh, or do anything you need to here. Sure, um, and the sales force will be, will be happy to help you determine whether you've got the right prerequisites or not. And if right. they, they need help from me, I'll, I'm happy to get involved in that as well. Yeah, you, you can call Georgia. Georgia can help you figure out if, you're, if you can skip that class or not. Now, like I said, if you're pursuing the certificate, then you can't skip it. But you can yeah. skip it initially and then go back and take it later just to get your uh, requirements in. Um, now, tell me a little bit about the, the projects and the assignments here. Uh, you know, I noticed that okay, the well, syllabus has it all in-house there. You go through the sure, lessons it, and it's, then what it's happens? It's all there. Okay, so, so at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the lesson, let's yeah. say I'm, I'm taking entering and storing data because mm -hmm. I've, I've finished my first lesson now. Right. So at the end of lesson two, here's a, a quiz, and it's asking me things like, what is a module? Uh, what is a namespace? How do you list the contents of a namespace? Uh, that kind of stuff, and then when you so when you've when you finish, so what is what is a module, and the answer is a file containing uh, Python code, is the simplest answer I can think of to that question, mm -hmm. uh, and then what is a namespace? A namespace is a uh, namespace is where the variable data is stored, which is a slightly vague answer, and I might get some corrections back from that, right. or I might not. How do you list the contents of a namespace? The answer is you use the DIR function. Okay. So there we go. Now, now as go a on. side note here, yep. um, all our questions are open-ended, so when he's talking about receiving corrections back, we don't just give you a grade and hand it back to you. We want to no. make sure that you know everything and you know it thoroughly uh, before you go on. So, so it's not uncommon for the instructor to hand it back to you and say, you know what, uh, you're kind of on the right track, but I want to hear some more explanation. Yeah, it's not a matter sure of it's not a matter of you were wrong and you failed in that exercise. Right. It's a matter of well, you're halfway right. there. And let's now go the rest of the way. Exactly. So when you complete it, you're pretty much going to have an A. <laughs> but it might be frustrating because we're, we're going to hammer on you until you yeah, get it right. Yeah, you may need to go around several times. Right. But the point is, by passing the exercise, we then know that the essential learning points have been covered. And right. you're ready to go on exactly. to the next, next and, and that's a material. Scott concept, too, because he yeah. said in his teaching experience that the ones who could get through the multiple choice uh, questions that easily, like... I was that kind of student. Uh -huh. um, half the time they didn't know what they were talking about when it came down to it. Uh, so you, you, you yeah, got right. to delve in a little deeper. We're trying to avoid the phenomenon of, of, of paper, cert paper qualifications yeah, without, no. any, without any real knowledge behind them. Yeah, that's, a, that's another question that I get a lot is um, how, how is this like the you know, Sunbase certification or, yeah. or this sort of, it's nothing like this at all. It's a, it's a real course. It, it's, we call it a certificate course, but that's because you receive a certificate a university certificate from the university. Well, the online. reason, yeah, the reason I, I really appreciated the opportunity to work with O'Reilly uh -huh. was because a couple of years ago we had some very serious uh, discussions in the Python Software Foundation uh -huh. about did we want to offer certifications? Did the foundation Exam want to become? Certifications. Yeah, did yeah. the foundation want to become involved with that thing? Right. And there were a couple of interesting uh, aspects to that. One was that that quite a few people felt that certifications don't really offer anything anyway because they know about the certifications where you just check the boxes, you do mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. multiple choice test, right. uh, and you can pass the exam without really knowing too much about what knowledge you're talking about. Knowledge doesn't necessarily You'd, mean experience. Knowledge it is not information, mean, that's right. right. Yeah, sure, data's not information. It, right. it's, just, it's just a random knowledge. So um, we decided that, that we weren't going to try and, and produce a, a certificate series ourselves simply because of the, uh, the amount of work that would have been involved. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy that there is now going to be uh, a Python certification available because I think, as I say, focusing on the, the wider world of Python applications, a lot of people are going to be using Python in the future who yeah. don't really have much of a clue as a programmer right now. Right. And uh, they're going to actually be able to have this, this demonstrated 
measurable skill uh, right. with a certificate to back it up that says, well, yeah, the person can actually right. write Python and, and has done some coding, not just he, he wrote a book and answered a test. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, I, I want to go on to the next courses, but okay. real quick, can you show me a, a project in here just so that they can okay, see how well, it Okay, well, right. Works. Let me let me so just hand, the, let me just hand that exercise mm -hmm. in first. Oh, I hope I can remember <laughs> my... Uh, username and password for this. Yeah. If it doesn't go in, we'll just forget it. But it, yeah, yeah it seems finished. to it's have. Fine. Okay, good. So, so uh, we've yeah. finished that that hands-on exercise. So we'll go back. So here's the the project for uh, lesson two. Okay. And, and these are says, very simple. We're yeah. still in the very very simple stage. Oh yeah, this is the second lesson. You can so really it, really go from for, here. Yeah, right. But it says here's an example of how the program might want to appear. So it's a program mm -hmm. that has to. It asks the students to enter their first name and enter their last name, and then it prints out, I'm pleased to meet you, first name. Last names right. are very, very simple indeed, and we're even giving the, the students some advice there. Now, I've already uh, answered that. That's in uh, Python 1, where do I need to be? I mean, Python 1 lessons, so I think I'll to hand in lesson 2 there. Uh, right. Comment or question for grader, may I proceed? to lesson yeah. three. Uh, a lot of communication mark. happens through that box right there. You know, the, 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 uh, the grading process is very interesting. It, it ends up that the instructors like Carrie uh, end up having a pretty close relationship with the students by doing yeah. this through, through the grading process, through emails, because it is all open and you are handing in an actual well, and, file. And the great thing is this uh -huh. all happens within the one learning environment. Right. I mean, the way you use this material mm -hmm. is effectively you're just going through the browser for a, right. a remote login session and everything happens on that desktop. You don't have to run any of your mm -hmm. own programs on your own mm -hmm. computer, so there are no problems with someone's a Mac person, doesn't mm -hmm. have the right bit of stuff because right. it's only there for the Windows people. So right. I've, I've handed my project in just by so clicking yeah. links on there, and now we're, we're back at the syllabus and, and, and ready to move on to the next yeah, lesson. And, and just right. see so the, now it's kind of the same on the other end, too, with the instructors. Uh, yep. We try to streamline it on their end as well so that they can concentrate on what's important, which is communicating with the student and making sure that their code, you know, looking at their code and, and you know, helping them out with that. Yep. Um, who does the grading? TAs, TAs at, oh, you mean the University of Illinois? Teaching Illinois. assistants, Teaches yeah. No, 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 this is in-house. Um, Carrie Butson is our lead instructor, and she's been with us since 1999. She's amazing. Um, and then we have several instructors uh, strewn about the uh, the country here. Some of them are in Champaign, where the University of Illinois is. Yep. Um, but you know they are considered uh, OST faculty. So um, so they'll be helping you uh, online from wherever they are in the world. And I guess if if the uh, Python certificate series right. becomes popular, uh -huh. we might even be looking for more instructors if the number of students grows. <laughs> well, there you go. That might be that might be relevant for for this crowd because they're a little more advanced. Now yeah. um, that segues into I, I want to hear. Well, real quick, you know, Dan Reno. Hi, Dan. I think I know you. Um, you wanted to know. You said the first course for Python looks to be a whole lot more involved in the PHP one. Um, is that just because Python just has a much more to it? I, you know, I'm not sure that's exactly the case because I'm looking at the syllabus here and I haven't really gone through the Python one, but just yep. knowing the intro of the PHP course, really it looks like the only difference between the two is the fact that the PHP course, uh, object-oriented PHP doesn't come until later in, I think, the, the, the last course, in fact. And I actually think that's more because it's not the full focus of PHP, where it is the full focus of Python, right? Yeah, that, that, would, that would be a fair summary. Is that correct? You know, it, yeah. It's getting to be more and more that uh, PHP is using the object-oriented systems more and more, but uh, I, I wouldn't consider it a basic concept of, of PHP. So I, I kind of waited until it became relevant in terms of building a Web 2.0 uh, site. So sorry, that's just a little aside there. Um, so, Python yeah. 2 through Python 4. We got Python 2 coming when? June? Uh, we're looking to try and get it out with a, with a June release date if we okay. possibly can. Yes, it's, it's hard work but worth it. Um, well, okay, in Python 2, mm -hmm. we wanted to, people to start to get a feeling of substantial achievement. 
right. uh, what they could do. Sure. So in Python 2, we start out uh, with a discussion of test-driven development, mm -hmm. and we teach them how to use the unit test system in Python. Ah, yes. Because Py the, the Python world is, is fairly rigorous about test-driven development. I mean, I'm... That's I'm, good. That's good that they build it in in the beginning. That's right. It's, yeah. I'm an old hand, and I've, I've spent too long writing code with no tests, so right. I actually had to <laughs> discipline myself uh -huh. Uh, to do it this way, but it is really good because the tests, the idea is in test driven development, you start out and you never write any code unless you have a failing test. So mm -hmm. basically the test can even act almost as the specification for your for your code. Oh. So we introduce uh, That's unit... interesting. Yeah, That's we introduce idea. unit testing with the, the Python unit test module. Mm -hmm. And I then proceed to go into areas which, which are actually quite difficult to use with, with unit testing. So. Uh, some of them anyway. We look at um, how you can store persistent data mm -hmm. using a number of mechanisms that are built into Python, like the, the pickle and the shelve mechanism. Sure. There's also a, a Python module called JSON, which uses the uh, JavaScript object notation. Uh, and we mentioned that because it's important for Python people who maybe need to, to communicate with programs in other languages. Now, what do you mean by job, like, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, what do you mean by JavaScript object, object, object notation? Do you mean the DOM? Uh, no, mean, JavaScript okay. object, nori, uh, ob object notation is just a way of describing data structures okay. of various kinds. Okay. And the reason it's important for Python programs to know about it is it's, it's used in all kinds of other languages as well. So sure. it gives you a, a mechanism for interchanging fairly complicated objects gotcha. and complicated complicated data structures okay. with people who are programming in, in entirely other languages. So okay. we felt that was useful. We also show people uh, how to do archiving with zip files and, and tar files okay. so that they can actually uh, look inside those tar files, find out what's inside them, extract individual components. Kind, kind, kind of, of a way to uh, extract yourself from the learning system itself and learn how it's done on, on uh, a more back in level. Well, that's right, yeah. And I mean, the, obviously, the idea is that people can take the knowledge that they're gaining and they can go and start playing with their other zip sure. files, uh, yeah, their own zip files in their own environment as well. So okay. there's no intention that students should only use the learning environment. Obviously, mm -hmm. we want them to download Python uh, and to be using their own, their own computers as well and, and be playing, playing with real data. Right. So once we've, we've taken people into the, the whole concept that, hey, data is actually for communicating with, with other systems and, and other people as well. Right. Then we spend three lessons explaining how to, to create user interface, graphical user interfaces. Okay, so by the time they're halfway through the lesson, uh, the halfway through the second course, mm -hmm. uh, we call that one getting more out of Python. They're actually starting to see, well, hey, now I've got this piece of code where when I run it, this window comes up and it's got two buttons. And when I click this button, something appears. And, right. and when I click that button, the program terminates. So mm -hmm. they're starting to understand the whole question of how do I write programs that respond to events? Because mm -hmm. too many programming languages, they, they, take the, they only look at uh, what used to be called batch processing where someone provides a chunk of data and you process it and, and produce output. Right. But GUIs, graphical user interfaces, are very different from that. Basically, you have to be ready. If the user is going to click that button at any time, right. then you need a piece of code in your program that does the right thing whenever that button is clicked, no matter what else is happening in the user interface. So right. it's a kind of a more complex environment. Okay. Once we've, we've given them a grasp of the database technology, mm -hmm. then, sorry, of the GUI technology, then we go on to relational databases. Uh -huh. And they start to understand, because again, of course, relational data is, is commonplace now. So mm -hmm. it's another very good way of interacting with existing systems, okay. is to read information from the database and make use of it. Now, is this concentrated on SQL? Is it more generic? Uh, it's a, it's a, a f yeah, we're concentrating initially on relational topics. Topics. So mm -hmm. I try and introduce database technology in such a way that it's not specific to a particular uh, to a particular technology. Okay, great. Um, but then, yeah, we do actually make use of the MySQL mm -hmm. database, which is part of the O'Reilly learning all environment. In housed in your learning environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can actually open up a, a terminal window and you can start mm -hmm. to interact with with a MySQL uh, database directly. All in the same. Which we do quite a lot of in the in the first environment. Yeah. Okay. So then um, we teach them how to use databases. We teach them uh, how to actually interact uh, 
-hmm. with databases and there's a small publishing example where books have publishers and authors so they get to see how related data can be manipulated sure. that kind of thing sure. so hopefully by the end of uh, by the end of of getting more out of python you can actually write uh, a program with a graphical user interface that's retrieving information from a relational database. It sounds database. like you'd be at a fairly intermediate level. You know, you, yeah, you could probably get by. The idea is that, yeah, the user should have a, right. a feeling of satisfaction and competence, I sure. think, at that stage. You know, if you can write a GUI-based program, mm -hmm. you've got some kind of feeling that you really mm -hmm. know what's going on behind the uh, the curtain, so to speak. Right. Now, you're probably still hammering down the specific details of Python 3 and 4, yep. but can you give me the gist of what they're going to be about? Because this is going to be later on in, I can in the year that they'll be yeah, released. Yeah, basically, uh, when we go to, to 3, we start to focus more on the building of applications to yeah. solve problems. And so, again, we're going to take a look at some of the specific modules in the standard library, mm -hmm. possibly some third-party modules, although I don't, I don't know whether we... I don't think we'll, we'll try to stray too far from the Python that you download. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we're trying to help people to, to solve real problems. We're also giving them a look underneath the interpreter, uh, the way the interpreter is actually uh, handling tasks. So for example, mm -hmm. we teach them that although you do an equality check in Python by writing something equals equals something else, mm -hmm. under the hood, what actually goes on is that the interpreter takes the something uh -huh. and it calls a particular method of that something object okay. with the thing that's the other side of the equal sign as the something else. So we try to, I'm, I'm trying to, to give people a feeling for what's going on inside the interpreter as right. their programs are being activated. Great. So we start to look at some of the more advanced features of Python, like uh, generators, for example, where you can write an expression that produces a, sequen a whole sequence of results rather mm -hmm. than just a single result. So that by the time they're finished, th their ability to create applications is enhanced, but also they've got a much stronger appreciation for Python as a programming system as well as just as a language. And they, they've got a, a considerable understanding of what's, w which moving parts are interacting as their programs execute. Right. Sounds like uh, they'll be ready to go to PyCon and actually have some meaningful conversations with well, them. You can go to <laughs> with people like you. You can right? go to PyCon and have meaningful conversations <laughs> right. with people like me without any knowledge yeah. at all because you know, we tend to have meaningful conversations like, would you like another beer at PyCon? That's always, <laughs> that's always a, a good question. But too, yeah. No, I mean, really, at, at, at PyCon, uh, there's a guy gives two uh, half-day tutorials, mm -hmm. and that, those would be enough for an experienced programmer to, to be able to ask, ask questions of, sure. of the other Python guys. Very <laughs> friendly conference as well. Right. Come to PyCon. <laughs> of course, that's not just why you would be taking a course. Um, no. We have a question that says, okay, seriously, what kind of career can I get after I take these courses? And, and that's a really good question because we build our certificate series with jobs in mind. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, um, jobs, yeah. We are vocational. Um, we, when Scott puts together a series and, and speaks with an author, his you know, MOD is uh, start out without any experience and finish up and be ready for at least an entry level position. Yeah. Um, so, with that, what what kind of careers? What kind of jobs? What kind? What are you hoping the graduates of the certificate series um, are going to gain from well, this? Well, that's that's an interesting question because I think it's likely to change over time. At mm -hmm. the moment, people with programming skills primarily look for jobs in the programming craft. Mm -hmm. But I think that I, my own impression is that we're going to see these, this particular sequence of courses be much more useful to a broader set of vocations. So I think this kind of, this kind of course, I mean the other O'Reilly classes as well, but obviously I know the, the Python content best. Right. This kind of course is, is going to be helpful to people who, as I said earlier, maybe the, the main thrust of their job isn't necessarily going to be programming, but they can enhance their job performance by being able to program. So, okay. I mean, I can see it being useful for journalists. I know mm -hmm. one journalist already is using Python extensively to analyze uh, data about foreign aid, right. and he's even used the Django framework to build a website that other people can use to mm -hmm. go and, and look at the same data that he's basing his journalistic conclusions on. Okay. Um, you know, Technicians of all kinds are going to need to understand programming and, mm -hmm. and 
Python specifically because it's being built into to so many other systems now. Um, so I think by the end of this by the end of this certificate series, you could make a credible claim to being employable as a junior programmer, for example, someone who wanted to climb onto the the right. information technology career ladder because could do so because you, you, you have, have got some courses worth of experience. There's you have some an practical experience portfolio. in there. That's right. That's yeah. I, I try to tell people, you know, keep the online portfolio because you can put it on your resume. Sure. And when someone, I, I've had multiple graduates of other uh, certificate series contact me and say, "Hey, I was in an interview and they wanted to know what kind of stuff I'd done," and yeah. I just uh, that's that's a portfolio. very good point. Yeah, there's been a lot of stuff on the net recently yeah. about about programmers who go to interviews, mm -hmm. and it's perfectly obvious when they get to the interview mm -hmm. that they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, people I've I've heard of people interviewing as Java programmers who couldn't write a basic <laughs> loop, oh. which is it seems incredible, but really? yeah, yeah, oh. and, and I mean, you know, Sad. people. Are, well, people are desperate for jobs, so right, I suppose right. they, they're going to try to apply for jobs even if they are outside their sphere of competence. But mm -hmm. if you can arrive at a, at a job interview and you're not just answering the questions that they're asking you, but you can say, well, here is this program what I wrote, right. and look what it does, and you know, take your laptop along and show them. That's That's, that's going to get you much further that's than uh, th uh, theoretical knowledge of dubious value. That's going to yeah. get your foot in the door, absolutely. You know, just the I word of the wise. So. Don't put that you have experience in Java if you can't write a Java loop for the person that's interviewing you. Um, <laughs> well, yes, know so. what you're talking about is usually a good idea in a job interview. Right, and, and, and mostly our, our students tend to be, you know, either people who, like you said, uh, want to keep going in their careers but then enhance it here. But then there's yep. also, I would say, a good portion of students who are trying to break into the IT yep. market in the first place, which is why right. we generally start with beginning courses. Mm -hmm. um, um, that being said, we do have a lot of uh, more advanced uh, programmers and software engineers that do go and and uh, maybe the first course might be a little quicker for them, but but then they find that they're filling in a lot of holes and then. Um, and the then the going other thing there. about the O'Reilly Technology O'Reilly School of Technology, of course, is that you're you've te you're teaching other topics which will be useful to people who already know programming. So if you know programming but you don't know SQL, there's a class on SQL which will help you with relational database. Right. If you want to get into the web world, there are classes on HTML and so on. So it's a fairly rounded uh, set of technologies that you're developing there. And I've, right. I've tried to make sure that Python kind of fits on in such a way that if when they finish the Python class, mm -hmm. the other classes are going to be more valuable as well because they'll mm -hmm. oh, I now know how, I, I can use Python exactly. to do that. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're, we're uh, running to the end there, but I don't oh, mind running heavens. over because there's a, there's a lot of questions here still, and I want to make excellent. sure that I cover as much as I can, sure. if possible. No, so I if, have a little more time are, if you yeah, do. Yeah, I sure do. I'm, I'm willing to stay a little longer if you all Glad are. Glad that people are asking questions. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah. This, this question says, uh, so the sandbox is basically PyDev Eclipse SDK plugin in a browser. That sounds That's about a, right to a me. That's <laughs> a reasonable summary. Yeah, yes. you can tell. In fact, they uh, O'Reilly call this system Ellipse. Ellipse. But Ellipse is, as you've correctly deduced, uh, a, 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 an Eclipse uh, system, which was interesting for me because I'd never used Eclipse mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. I started to develop these classes. And I was quite impressed by the way you've actually managed to integrate right. everything so that there's no need to go out of Eclipse. Right. But yes, it's, it's Eclipse with plugins. We're using PyDev, mm -hmm. uh, there's a SQL plugin. There are various other plugins that, that O'Reilly have developed themselves mm -hmm. so that you get this seamless hand in. I'm still uh, trying to refresh my page because I'm wondering whether anyone's going to grade that project. <laughs> Doesn't They're normally happen this webcast. quickly, but <laughs> I was told, I was told that there might be people paying attention yeah. if I happen to hand in a project during this Well, the uh, turnaround this is, interview. is generally, someone did ask that, what, what's the turnaround between hand in and hand back? We, we officially say that uh, three days, but unofficially it's almost always within one business day. They say three um, it, days. It's asynchronous, but they're working constantly. Mm. I, I don't know that Carrie has ever taken a, a vacation where she hasn't brought her computer and done grading on it. That she's that she's that dedicated to it. Yeah. So um, but yes, Eclipse the Ellipse system um, we built originally for our Java uh, certificate series. Um, and and we mainly kept it because Eclipse is so 
you know, it's so easy to make plugins for various technologies, yeah. and and our we don't want to make too many sandbox systems. So that's, we don't, a we, that's a that's a learning curve. That's an in-house thing, right? Something O'Reilly did themselves. That's something we do. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did. Yeah, we we built we build all our sandbox systems in-house because we want to make sure that it is the absolute best learning system for that particular technology. Um, but if we can reuse a sandbox for a different uh, language like uh, Python, then mm -hmm. we're happy to do that because then. Um, that's one less thing for our students to get familiar with. Um, we have a question here. Any lessons on database connection? I think that I think that's true. Oh, hi, Massimo. Um, yeah, we do talk briefly about database connections, but um, we don't go into the refinements of the different ways to connect a database using the the different driver modules. We pretty much assume SQL is going to be a SQL, MySQL. Mm -hmm. uh, is going to be it. So we're not we're not going to expand that stuff into PostgreSQL and, mm -hmm. and the various other databases. You don't want to get too distracted. No, the that's main, right. It, it's, we want to focus mostly on getting things working in one environment rather right. than confusing people by by having too many possibly. Uh, Brian, I agree. Carrie does need to take a break, or we need to hire more. We we do have several instructors, but believe me when I say we've tried. Carrie loves her students. She does not want to let them go. Well, that's so, good. That's good. <laughs> so it's more it's I more see about that. Simon Foster is asking, what about networks, frameworks, and web programming, and so on? In yes. the fourth class, mm -hmm. uh, we actually start to teach them something about how to manipulate the the network environment using oh, Python. Good. And so they sometimes they will write a client to interact with a, a server that we provide for them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll have to write the server, and then we'll test it by oh, good. by connecting from a client. So yeah, they will be used. They will be fully capable of, of network programming, which mm -hmm. means we're going to have to explain a little bit about the TCP/IP sure. framework. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, they they'll be but able to write. You need to know that anyway. You, everyone should nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly if you want to work in in IT. So yeah, they'll they'll know something about network yeah, programming. Yeah, and, and and what about Frameworks is that even is that possible in this course? I, I know that we, we don't like to include something in a course unless you can actually build it uh, technologically. Yeah, no complex installs at home to get right. things no, working. Right. No, we we don't right. want you installing yeah. anything at home. It has to be all in house, provided for you. So well, you can install whatever you like at home. But <laughs> yeah. We don't want to rely on you having to be able to do that, right? right? We don't want Which to put that why, up there. Which is why it's all provided in the the teaching yeah. environment, basically. But generally yeah. speaking, uh, most most frameworks um, have the same types of concepts, and and most IDEs, you know, try to be a little similar. Sure, to Sure, and of course, I mean, O'Reilly aren't mm -hmm. unmindful of the fact that some frameworks are very popular. So Scott mm -hmm. and I are talking. In the distant days when, when the Python certificate series is, is fully up and running, mm -hmm. probably going to take a look at Django then, because there Django. are a, a lot of people interested in that framework okay. and a lot of demand for training there, yeah. I know. So the answer is maybe. <laughs> we'll see. OK. Uh, yeah. how, many, how many students at Desert Riley School have? Well, you now, know that's an that, interesting right? question. Right now, we have about uh, between 4,000 and 4,500 active students. Wow. Um, our, our courses are completely self-paced. So active students means that you know you might be finishing a course. You know, we, we try to make each course around 40 hours of work. But since our students are pretty busy people, some people are able to finish that in two to four weeks. Some people take a year. Some people have to go away and come back. So and our it active doesn't students, matter, right? You can take as long as you like. You can take as long class, as you right? need. We have a lab fee system just for that purpose. That um, you know, it's about. Ten dollars, twenty dollars uh, tops a month for lab fee, and what that does is that that uh, provides all the technologies um, and and makes you available to the instructor for as long as you need. And a lot of people keep that beyond the coursework because they want to keep working it's on kind stuff. Of a good, they want to have way to their get mentoring portfolio. From someone they want to be able to ask the technologies. The, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. right. And then a lot of people need to go away, maybe work on a project at work. And so we have a way to freeze the account so that you're not paying for lab fees if you're not working on it. So, so there's that. Um, the Yorkshireman in me appreciates that. We are all very fond of value for money in Yorkshire. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, and, and I appreciate it as a programmer because, you know, you never know when you get slapped with a project and have to go yeah. away. Yeah. Peter also um, says, can I compare Python to Perl? I suppose Python is more verbose than Perl. Mm -hmm. um, Perl's a great language, actually. People sometimes say, well, why should I, you know, I've got this program in Perl, why should I convert it to Python? And I say, well, does it work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, there's no need to convert it to Python. You know, right. Perl has actually been optimized for uh, a lot of things, particularly 
if you're text slinging with regular expressions, mm -hmm. uh, Pearl has, as, as Tim Peters so elegantly puts it, optimized the snot out of that functionality. <laughs> so uh, it's did he very use the good. Word snot? He did That's indeed use excellent. the word snot. Yes. <laughs> Um, but he's, uh, he's pointed out that, that Perl is actually a very good language for that kind of thing. Now, the thing about Perl is, if you're using it all the time, no problem at all. My own experience with Perl, because uh, I did use Perl on the World Wide Web in the, mm -hmm. the 1990s for a couple of years, my own experience was, because I wasn't using it all the time, I wasn't really sufficiently disciplined to develop my code fully commented in such a way that the structures are obvious. Kind of and because of, together, yeah, you know? and be, I, I call it sometimes programming with a trowel. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll take some of this and some of that, mm -hmm. and you you fit it all together, and it, it sets, and you've got a program, but you've you've not really know what you you're doing necessarily. So, uh, if you're programming that way, then you go back to a program you wrote in three months' okay. time, uh, and you're kind of scratching your head a bit and thinking, "Ooh, what did this bit do here?" You don't get the same problem with with Python. Mm -hmm. Now. You say things like that, and people who use Perl are kind of up in arms. Or I yeah, have I, I'm just getting this vision of Peter Scott on the other side, <laughs> our, our Perl instructor, or our Perl author. Well, he should have been here. Shouldn't that would be he? a but, fantastic but, debate. No, I mean people <laughs> people think that that I'm criticizing Perl when I yeah. when I do that. I'm not. Perl, Perl is actually an excellent tool mm -hmm. for for the craftsman, but I think yes. probably. Your skill level needs to be a bit higher uh -huh. with Perl right. in order to be able to write code that you can you can you know later on go back and, and modify. You need a bit more discipline, yeah. maybe than maybe you do maybe with, with Python, Python it's easier with. to get up and running. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I, I dabble in Perl a little bit, and I can see what you're saying. I think there Python's friendlier to beginners. Sure. Yeah, but um, I'm not putting Perl down, right, guys? <laughs> Peter Scott, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Eee, can the portfolio be downloaded from the OST sandbox? Well, that's one um, for yes, you, actually, right? yeah, that's one for me. And if you have a lab, yeah, you have a lab account that has full FTP capabilities. Um, right now, it's it's a little clunky to do. You need to use your own FTP program. But our uh, a solution our, is coming. Our, our solution is coming. Our uh, developer extraordinaire, Matt Roberts, is uh, adding his final touches to. What we currently call Code Runner 2, um, but oh, it is a much more runner. robust um, learning uh, integrated development environment. If you are a student right now and you know what I'm talking about with Code Runner, you will love this version. That should be coming out in June as well. Does it go beep beep? <laughs> no, <Okay. laughs> but just one. We could add that in. Um, our students located all over the world. Yes, I would say about 80. 85% of our students are within the United States and 15% are abroad. Um, and you can take them anywhere you have a, uh, uh, an internet connection and a web browser and email access. So we've had military people take them from submarines, oh, Alaska, wow. Iraq, um, you name it. Cool. Um, I'm actually making a, a trip to the Far East in a, a month's time, and yeah. I'm going to be trying to interest people in the O'Reilly yeah. courses. And, and we're going to be introducing well. this to, uh, to India. We'll be going to India in December. Um, do you get CPEs per course or only after obtaining the certification? Do you mean the continuing education unit, CEUs? Um, that yeah, is I per think course. CPE is co continuous professional education. It's the same kind of yes, thing. Yeah, same right. kind of thing. Um, the University of Illinois calls it continuing education units. Yeah. And, and what happens is once you complete a, an individual course, then um, your student start page, which kind of encapsulates all of it, um, sort of allows you to yeah. request not a transcript. We, we, uh, I'm very careful to say that uh, ah, okay. there's no transcripts because that would imply a degree-seeking uh, ah, program. Okay, right. Yeah, sorry about um, that. But uh, the continue, you can request a CEU letter which comes directly from the University of Illinois Office of Continuing Education, so it's official. Um, and then once you request all four CEU letters from the certificate series, then you will automatically, the request will automatically be put in to send your certificate from, again, it's directly from the University of Illinois Office of Continuing Education. Um, I'm a lead technical writer, says Ursula, and want to know how useful these courses are for my team. I think in order to answer that question properly, I'd need to know, are your team actually documenting Python systems? Mm -hmm. If they are, I imagine uh, they'd get a lot of useful insight from them. Yes. But if you want to put a follow-up in, we'll, we'll try and pick it up. Okay. Um, we have how much street cred does O'Reilly have? I signed up for a couple of courses because of the convenience. Um, 
One of the biggest reasons, you know, we, we've had a partnership with the University of Illinois um, since we were our own standing company called User Active. And I in have to say, the University of Illinois, I, when I was uh, nothing but a young lad, mm -hmm. I used to work in computer based education, and the University of Illinois is, actually has one of the longest histories of any academic institution in that yes. area. Um, if you remember, uh, the, what is it, 2001 A Space Odyssey, HAL 9000 was supposedly built at the University of Illinois. That's how far back. Their technological program goes, I'm and they are I consistently let you do that, Dave. <laughs> yeah, they are consistently listed as a top five school in computer science. And as a matter of fact, the computer science department currently sponsors our uh, continuing education courses. I think the fact the that the University education. of Illinois is behind them is definitely going to lend O'Reilly some right. street cred. I think you know, right. it, O'Reilly. Who cares what O'Reilly say? <laughs> it's actually gone through well, a university accreditation of some kind right. by the by <laughs> Illinois, right? Well, it, it's it's sponsored by. The University of Illinois, so they go yeah. through and they uh, they definitely uh, put their stamp of approval on each of our courses. Now, that being said, we specifically uh, relish this partnership and and uh, uh, being placed within the O'Reilly family because O'Reilly has a huge reputation among information technology companies. Um, uh, you know, because they, they've been around since, uh, in the, area since of op the 70s. Particularly in the area of open source technologies as well. I mean, not uniquely. Particularly in open source technologies. Because they've actually expanded now into the .NET world and things like that. Right. But yeah, I mean, O'Reilly was for a long time the go-to publisher for open source. Exactly. I like to say on our website, I say that uh, uh, the University of Illinois um, created the first graphical web browser and O'Reilly Media created the first commercial website. So it's just kind of this partnership made in heaven. We're, we're so thrilled to be a part of O'Reilly and to be partnered with just the University of Illinois. Just let me draw your attention to that dialog box. So, uh, yeah, my, uh, my, my battery is leaving my computer. Okay, Massimo I'm asks, any lesson on calling C and C++ functions from Python? We may manage to squeeze C types into the final course, the final four, uh, course number four. Uh, there's nothing on building uh, extension modules or uh, embedding Python inside C or C++. Uh, that would need to be something we'd consider adding as a, a separate course. I would think it's probably a bit involved for, for beginners. Right. Now, uh, are these credits transferable anywhere? No, they are not currently transferable. These are considered non-credit professional development courses from the University of Illinois. They're for your job. They're for your resume. But that being said, these, this is not an exam-based certification. This is not something to put underneath necessarily your um, your other section, your other professional credit section. Um, you can put this under your education section. You can put this under your experience section. You can say, I do have um, you know, a year of experience in Python, and I can prove it because I've got this portfolio. Plus, in my education section, I attended continuing education courses from the University of Illinois Office of Continuing Education through the O'Reilly School of Technology. Um, OK. so. It looks like we're done with questions. Excellent. And I, I want to thank everybody for coming here. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I and, see we have nearly 100 people on this yeah, uh, webcast. I'm actually uh, very impressed with, with, with the way you've put this audience together. OK, and we've recorded this, so we're going to try to, to put it together and, and get it on the website for anyone who missed it. So Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Great everybody. To see you. And uh, we'll see you next time.